Good afternoon. My name is Cheryl Nickerson. I'm a professor of life sciences in the School of Life Sciences in the Center for Fundamental and Applied Microbiomics at the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University. And today I'm going to provide you with an update of the current state of my team's spaceflight microbial research and some of the key findings from our studies over the past decade spanning from 2020 to 2030. You know, 10 years ago in 2020, I think that few could have envisioned the kinds of paradigm shifts and resulting progress that had been made in understanding microbial responses to spaceflight, especially those responses that are important for causing infectious disease in astronauts and for biofouling environmental control and life support systems, which we call ECLIS, and the resulting translational impacts that have come from these discoveries. My team has been deeply involved in working closely with NASA in these areas of research since 1998, and we are honored to have contributed to several of these discoveries. But before I can tell you about our discoveries to benefit both crew health and the integrity of ECLA systems, I first need to take a moment to tell you about some of the major challenges that the field had to overcome in general, or at least address to a certain extent in order to be able to make the kinds of rapid advances that my team and others have made in spaceflight microbial research. And so this is a slide about what did it take to get to this point, and each one of these boxes show the major things that enable these kinds of discoveries that we have made. So prior to 2020, funding largely focused on the end product. Uh, for example, the vaccine, the pill, the box, if you will. Um, with less attention focused on understanding mechanisms, and mechanisms are what are required to develop efficacious end products. And that, in my opinion, was putting the proverbial cart before the horse, which is why you see that picture depicted centrally on the slide. And it also, this approach had also predictably led to the stagnation of product development. Because I think as most of us can appreciate, without understanding the underlying mechanisms of biological responses, which by definition includes testing their role in functional phenotypes, it's just extremely difficult to get to an efficacious translatable product. So the first box on the top left speaks to that very point. So there has been a strategic shift to prioritize understanding of mechanisms underlying microbial responses to spaceflight before expecting translational development. And as I like to say in research and development or in R&D, there is no D without the R. The next important uh, uh, challenge that has been uh, largely overcome now in 2030 was the move of space biology to SMD, which has enabled research campaigns that have allowed larger budgetary commitments at the scale necessary to enable the kinds of next generation discoveries that are only driven by interdisciplinary collaborations. Next, routine access to and from spaceflight research platforms, which still in 2030, however, includes the ability to land at major research sites for immediate sample return. And you might say, well, we're past LEO or low Earth orbit now. We shouldn't need to be returning biological samples back to Earth uh, for processing analysis. Well, you're right, but unfortunately, we still do because we haven't made enough progress yet. We made progress, but we haven't made enough progress yet in a number of areas that would facilitate everything being done in flight, automated, everything we want, so we don't have to return anything to Earth. And two of the boxes in the bottom explain uh, uh, where progress is still needed. So we've made good progress in, but we still have not in 2030 developed fully integrated modular automated spaceflight hardware with a broad range of capabilities, most certainly including analytical precision and accuracy, which is equivalent to the same kind of research quality instrumentations uh, that we have in our conventional labs. And until we get that, we cannot do everything fully automated in space flight. So you're still going to need some aspect of sample return. We've made progress, not there yet in 2030. 
Likewise, another area that we've made progress on in 2030, but we're still not there yet as it pertains to spaceflight biological hardware, is that spaceflight biological hardware needs to be built with a simultaneous input from both engineers and biologists. Now, that has happened in the last 10 years from 2020 to 2030, but it hasn't happened to the extent yet that uh, that we're ready to rock and roll when we get a spaceflight hardware in our hands to start a biological uh, optimization experiment. So prior to 2020, um, spaceflight hardware was typically made by engineers, very smart engineers, by the way, who developed this hardware independently of, uh, of working with biologists. And remember, engineers aren't biologists, and remember, biologists aren't engineers either. And so these very smart engineers uh, integrated and designed into this flight hardware capabilities that they thought were important for biologists to use in their experiments. And they were quite right. What they engineered into that hardware was important for biologists, but because there was not a pairing uh, with biologists when they were making this hardware, a lot of things were left out. And what that meant prior to 2020 were often years and tens of thousands or more dollars wasted in pre-flight ground optimization with biological flight hardware with the scientists having to spend a lot of time and money trying to make their experiment fit into the hardware. Whereas if you had worked this the other way around, that wouldn't have been an issue, right? But we have made good progress on that in the last 10 years. We're not there yet, but now biologists and engineers are talking simultaneously when they're developing the hardware. And that partnership is a beautiful thing and it needs to continue. And then lastly, um, advanced validated ground-based spaceflight analog bioreactors have been developed, which are helping us predict aspects of microbial responses to partial or fractional gravity like we would see on the moon and Mars. And these bioreactors are important to supplement those that have been used to predict uh, uh, microbial responses to low Earth orbit uh, spaceflight studies. That, that have been useful in predicting microgravity responses. So with that context in mind provided by the previous slide, I'm now gonna give you a status update on four of our major spaceflight microbial research areas. Uh, so the first one being uh, basic mechanisms of microbial spaceflight responses. So uh, building upon our, our previous phenotypic and transcriptomic and proteomic studies that were done uh, on both the shuttle and, and the ISS. Uh, we have now developed and tested a multi-stimulus model incorporating mechanotransduction. Um, and and um, mechanotransduction is basically the response of a cell, any cell, including a microbial cell, to a physical force, and then translating that physical force into a biological outcome, a biological response. And we have developed and tested that model in both spaceflight and spaceflight analog conditions that includes biological, chemical, and physical components to define how and why bacteria exhibit these unexpected responses to culture in the spaceflight environment to try to get at the underlying biological, chemical, and physical mechanisms. And these studies further support uh, our previous work that has uh, further validated there are indeed conserved spaceflight response mechanisms that are operative across multiple diverse bacterial species. Secondly, factors affecting microbial virulence. Um, our original studies uh, on the enhanced virulence of salmonella uh, that we observed during multiple spaceflight experiments and also on our ground-based spaceflight analog uh, NASA-designed bioreactor culture systems uh, provided us with important guidance to expand our understanding of the underlying mechanisms in subsequent spaceflight studies, which we have now incorporated gut microbiome, and we have defined a, defined a new aspect of salmonella virulence that uh, we believe will be able to provide real translational benefit to human health. Next, understanding the relationship between spaceflight, immune cell function, and infectious disease risk for the crew. So again, leveraging from our, our previous studies where we looked at both the impact of the, of the true spaceflight environment of microgravity and spaceflight analog culture on salmonella virulence, as well as in-flight and flight analog infection of both 3D biomimetic tissue models and animal hosts, we have identified, now identified other pathogens that are directly relevant to crew health that also exhibit, like salmonella did, increased virulence increased pathogenesis characteristics and globally altered their gene expression profiles under these conditions. 
And now we have characterized the impact of these changes on astronaut immune cells. And these studies have allowed us to discover a synergistic effect between the increased micro microbial virulence we've seen in spaceflight and reductions in immune cell function of the crew, of the astronauts, which have redefined infectious disease risks assessment for the crew and which have, are now used by NASA. They've also, our findings have also elucidated what's long been sought after for a relationship to clinical disease and they have supported the development and application of uh, effective countermeasures for treatment and prevention. And then finally, uh, microbial biofilm formation and control as it pertains to space habitat design and systems performance. And again, building upon our previous spaceflight and spaceflight analog studies uh, with both uh, Bob McLean's lab and Mark Ott's lab, we have now identified spaceflight induced alterations in polymicrobial biofilm formation. Uh, efficacy of antimicrobial disinfectants and the impact of microbial induced corrosion on ecolus systems in space habitats. And these studies and our discoveries have led to novel antimicrobial treatment approaches for lunar habitat and exploration missions. So then where do we go from here? Well, we know that wherever humans go, microbes go. We know that microbes are essential for our health, our homeostasis, uh, maintaining our physiology. We know they're important for the health of the space environment, space habitat. We know that they're critical for our environment. And so understanding the microbiology of spaceflight is predictably critical for maintaining crew health and habitat integrity and sustainability during exploration missions to Mars and other deep space destinations. So where do we go from here? Well, all of our knowledge where we started off in microgravity, now we've transitioned to life uh, uh, beyond low Earth orbit, so fractional and partial gravity, and we're continuing to go into deeper space. So all of the data from these studies will expand our knowledge and technology to help us understand how the deep space environment changes host microbial relationships, regardless of whether those hosts are human or animal or plant. Uh, that will also characterize how multiple stimuli in this environment impact microbial fouling, corrosion, and system performance will help us define how long duration exposure to spaceflight alters microbial characteristics and will be critical in helping us make advances in synthetic biology to make on-demand products in spaceflight, for example, pharmaceuticals, and also important to decrease resource needs in deep space. And we can apply these lessons learned to mitigate risk to crew health and improve the efficiency and lifetime of the vehicle and its ecosystems. So in closing, just to reiterate that as humans live and work for longer periods in space, understanding the impact on microbial responses and associated risks for crew health and habitat sustainability are critical to benefit human exploration and they will shape NASA's vision and strategy for biological and physical sciences research. Thank you very much.